now. Uh, so uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Nam Lai from Indiana, and he's giving a talk in, in our virtual analysis and PD seminar this May, and his title is Singular Fourth Order Equations of Munch Ampere Type. Please, now. Thank you very much, Hung, for the invitation. And I also would like to thank uh, Connor and Yifeng for organizing this wonderful seminar. And I would like to thank everyone for coming. So today I will talk about singular fourth order equation of Monson Bell type. So this is based on John Work with Binzo from Beijing University. So this is the outline of my talk. I will introduce some singular fourth order equations of Monson Bell type. Then I will discuss about the solvability. And after that, I will talk about application to the approximation of minimizer of the rose sonnes model in economics. And then if time permits, I will talk about some ideas of the proof. And so let's get started. So today we will talk about some boundary value problems for fourth order equation of this type. So this is the equation that uh, I write down here. Okay, so let me see if my pencil work now. Sorry. All right. So this is the equation that we will consider. Um, the object we are interested in is the unknown function u, which is seem to be uniformly convex. That means that the Hessian is positive definite. And so if we look at the equation, it looks very complicated, so let me walk you through it. And so in this equation, we have the coefficient matrix capital U super IJ. That's the, the cofactor matrix of the Hessian of U. And so in two dimension, it's very nice to see what is this matrix is all about. In two dimension, we compute the Hessian determinant of the function U by this formula. And then we can compute the matrix of cofactors by this expression. And so essentially it's just a couple of entries enter into this Hessian matrix. Okay. And then when we have a uniformly convex function U, we can compute the Hessian and then we can compute the determinant of the Hessian and then we can take the inverse. So that's the quantity that we have inside here. And after that, we take two more derivative and then we plug in to the everything in the left-hand side. And so, Overall, we have a fourth order equation in terms of an unknown uniformly convex function U. And on the right-hand side, it is some expression involving up to second order derivative of U. And so I will specify more about the kind of equation as we move on. So please stop me at any time if you have any question. So sometimes I will remind you what is the metrical factor during the talk. Okay, so, but capital U is always the metric of cofactor of the Hessian of U. So this kind of equation appear in many situations ranging from geometry to physics and to economics. So I will consider the first case where the right-hand side just depends on the spatial variable, but somehow on the left-hand side, I consider a little bit more expression, more general expression that just the inverse of the determinant of the Hessian. So I put some uh, G prime for some suitable function G. And so in this case, when G is this power function, but with this particular power, this comes from the R5 mean coverage equation in R5 geometry. And then when the function G is just log of T. And so in this case, the derivative of log is just one over T. And so that's exactly the expression that we just wrote out in the previous slide. And so this expression comes from the upper equation in complex geometry. And so another way to write out the upper equation is that you write into this expression. And here, sometimes I will give the notation little g upper ij to denote the matrix of the, the inverse matrix of the Hessian matrix. And so somehow the expression on the left is you take the double diversion of the inverse matrix of the Hessian. And so this is called the Apple equation. And so this is the one that we will most care about in this talk. On the other hand, now let's get back to the Apple equation with the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side, I specify more. So somehow we have some expression like this. It comes from the Q Laplacian. 
And we also add some free term. So depend only on the spatial variable and the function u. And so this kind of problems appear in many contexts related to some traditional problems in physics, in electricity, and in economics. So in physics, it's a beer in the approximation of the Newton problem of minimal resistance. And in electricity, it's a beer in the thin electric cell. And then in economics, it's a beer in the approximation of the process unit model. So I will focus on the two uh, examples later on. Now let's look at the equation that we will be talking about in this lecture. And so on the left-hand side, you have some kind of April type equation. And so let me recall that the matrix capital U IJ is the matrix of cofactor of the Hessian of U. And on the right-hand side, we have some Q Laplacian type expression with some function F naught. And so it turns out that this equation had a variational structure because it's the euler lorentz equation for this functional. So the third term, if you ignore the term cap and capital F naught here, it's just like the digital energy. But you have the next term, which is the log of the determinant of the Hessian of U. And so what's the capital F naught here? It's just the antiderivative of little F naught in the Z variable. And so somehow this equation can be difficult to remember, but one way to remember is that it comes from the variational structure of the oil, you know, of some functional like the log of the determinant. And so the negative sign here is very important. It's say that this functional is actually convex. Are there any questions so far? All right. So somehow is it difficult to handle further the equation? However, in our situation, we can rewrite are for the equation into a system of two equations. One equation for U, the unknown itself, and another is for the W. And W is just the inverse of the Hessian determinant. So this comes from the expression here we see on the left-hand side. And so somehow from this expression involving W and the determinant of the Hessian of U, we can rewrite as a monsoon bay equation for U with the right-hand side at the inverse of W. And another equation is the equation for W itself. And so if we just express this term by W, then we have some kind of linear equation for W, but the coefficient is not something that we know. The coefficient matrix is unknown. That comes from the matrix of the cofactor of the Hessian of U. And actually, this equation is called the linearized Monson by equation for W because the coefficient matrix capital UHS come from linearizing the Monson by equation. So somehow, if we take the determinant of the Hessian, we can view that as a function of the Hessian entry. And so we can take the partial derivative with respect to its Hessian entry. And that's how we get the metrical factor capital U. Another way to view this expression LU, W, is to look at the it mentioned of the expression on the left-hand side here. So we would like to expand the expression determinant of the Hessian of U plus DW in, in T. And so we expand everything out and we look at the coefficient for T and that is exactly the expression LUW. And so these two viewpoints tell us that, that the expression LUW is exactly a linear monson bear uh, operator. All right, so, so far, we managed to write out a fourth order equation into a system of two equations. One is a monson bay equation for U, another is a linearized monson bay equation for W. And so now we would like to understand about the global solvability under suitable boundary condition. And so the way we wrote our equation tell us that it's a very natural to consider describing the boundary value of U and the boundary value for W because we have one equation for U and another equation for W, but of course we see that in here, the operator also depends on U itself. But somehow this is a very natural problem. And this problem I will call it the second boundary value problem. 
Of course, there are many other boundary value problems you can consider for this kind of equation. You can consider describing the value of u and the value of the gradient of u on the boundary. But actually, that's just describing the normal derivative u because when you know u, you know all the tangential derivative of u on the boundary. And so that problem is called the first boundary value problem. However, we don't know anything about the solvability of the first boundary value problem for general convex domain in any dimension from two and above. And actually there are many analysis for this uh, first boundary value problem, but we only obtain some kind of uh, generalized solution. But in order to do that, we have to yield the second boundary value problem. So somehow this problem is very natural to consider in the setting of this kind of fourth order equation of motion beta. All right, and so far, so um, we discussed that the natural problem is the second boundary value problem. And so we will work on some domain we call omega. And so omega in this talk will be an open, smooth, bounded, and uniformly convex domain in our end. And this is our equation. And so somehow you see the appearance of a new parameter called gamma here. And so usually in this talk, gamma will be one, but somehow I plug in gamma so that I can turn it on to be one or zero because somehow for general discussion, I can talk about gamma to be zero. But the main point of the talk will be gamma is called one, all right? And so we rewrite our equation into the one is the linear Monson equation for W, another is the Monson equation for U, and we describe the value of U and W on the boundary. All right. And so far we see that we have a negative sign in front of the Q Laplacian term. And that sign is very crucial because we would like to solve this problem for general boundary value phi and psi. But if you change the negative sign here into the plus sign, then somehow for very general initial data phi and psi, we have a non-existent result. And so therefore it's not a good problem to, uh, to start with. And so therefore the negative sign here is very crucial. And so later on, we see that for very general domain in two dimension and the phi and psi, we can solve the problem for, for all the data. All right, and so now what kind of data we can put on the function uh, phi and psi? And so this is the fourth order equation. And so somehow we would like to understand about fourth order derivative for the solution. And so it's natural to consider a little bit better about the data. So I will consider phi to be C5, but you can consider to C4 gamma or something like that. But for simplicity, let me stick with C5. And somehow psi, is related to W, but W had two more, two less derivative than U. And so therefore the data for W is psi, we assume to be C3 globally. And if we look at this equation, uh, we will look for the uniformly convex solution U. And so therefore the Hessian determinant of U will be positive and bound it away from zero and infinity. And so therefore it is natural to consider that that value here is positive on the boundary. So this is a very natural condition. And so we need C5 because we want to have some kind of C4 solution. And then we need the condition because we want the solution to be uniformly convex. And so that's the, the natural condition. All right. So now let's look carefully into the expression on the right-hand side, because so far we just focus more on the left-hand side. And so here I yield the Einstein uh, convention to sum up all the quantity involved. And so if we do the expansion of the Q Laplacian term here, this is what we obtain. And we see that unless Q is equal to, we see that it is very highly singular in the Hessian variable, because when Q is bigger than two, and if the gradient of of u is very large, then this is similar in the Laplace of u. And when q is less than two, we see that the gradient of u can be zero. And so therefore we have trouble with the first term. And so we have a lot of trouble all around. On the other hand, the only nice term is that when q is equal to two. When q is equal to two, this term disappear, but this term is just like the minus Laplace of u. 
However, if we just look for yield, it just, you know, convex. Then the Laplace of yield is just a negative measure. And so therefore, you see that even when Q is equal to, we don't have a trouble with the gradient term involving Q, but somehow the right-hand side is already very singular because it's just a measure. And so that's how we see that this equation we call singular average equation. The singular, the singularity stands for the singularity on the right-hand side here. And the after equation comes from the quantity on the left-hand side. Right. And so now let me uh, mention a little bit about some difficulties in dealing with this kind of equation. And so now I turn on the parameter gamma. And so when gamma is equal to zero, we don't have the trouble with the Q Laplace term, but we only have the expression F naught here. And so somehow, in this case, a very useful perspective to look at this equation is that to look at the uh, linearized Monson-Bay operator in the non-divergent form. So somehow I will um, mention a little bit more later that the linearized Monson-Bay equation can be expressed both as a non-divergent form operator or in the divergent form operator. But when gamma is equal to zero, we can, that's the very helpful perspective to look at this equation. The trouble with this equation when gamma equals zero is that this term, the term F naught here, can have low singularities or can have you know, low integrability because somehow let's say the case that F naught just depends on the spatial variable. If we start with some F naught and then if it had low integrability, you could, you could not improve anything about it because that's what we are given with. And so, this is the, the key difficulty in this problem. And it turns out to be a very interesting problem to see what kind of integrability you can put on the right-hand side to, for the problem to be solvable. All right. On the other hand, when gamma is equal one, and so we have the real Q Laplace term on the right-hand side. So in this case, we have a very singular right-hand side. And in this case, somehow, if we look at what we spend here, you see that for different value of Q and for different range of the gradient of U, we see that the right-hand side is very singular and maybe it's not even continuous because let's say that Q is less than two. And when U is called phi on the boundary, so U can have the minimum point in the interior and that minimum point, the gradient of U vanishes. And so that's why we have a lot of trouble with the, the term here, the U to the power Q minus two when Q is less than two. And so in this case, if we look at the expression in terms of the non-divergent form, then we have a lot of trouble because of the expansion we just saw. And so therefore, in this case, the right perspective to look at the equation is to yield the divergent form structure of the equation. Because somehow if we look at what happened in this vector field, so roughly speaking, this vector field is like du to the power q minus one but we already consider Q at least one. And so somehow this term is not so bad. This vector field is not so bad. If we know some information about the gradient of U. However, this perspective is very nice for only for two dimension because we don't know anything about the higher dimensional cases. And so on the other hand, if we know some uh, prior right information about the gradient of U, then if we can know how to yield some divergent form structure to, to get some better information about the solution yield, then the right hand side actually is self improving. It means that when you have certain threshold of regularities, it will improve a little bit. And so somehow it's a bad because we only know how to do in 2D, but it's nice that it is self improving. And so that's the trade off between the, the two uh, regime. Somehow uh, I don't have the time to talk about uh, a similar problem, but actually this problem is very similar to another problem in uh, physics called the dual semi geographic equation. And so in that case, if we look at the time regularity of the dual semi geographic equation, we have to yield the divergent form structure of the linear monson bay operator to consider. Can I have a question now? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, uh, so you said that it's, it works for 2D. What if Q equals to two when you have the Laplacian, then uh, does it work for multi-dimensions? That's a very good question. And unfortunately, it's also, uh, we only know how to do it in 2D because the, the, all the difficulty is, st is still there, like in the divergent form. So 
it's, it's nice expression. But in that case, the Laplace of U has very low integrability to start with. Yes, thank, thank you for the question. Hey, Nan, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, so you mentioned like this is uh, the same difficulty in uh, semi job equation. But in semi job equation, the, uh, the domain is changing, right? But here you have the domain is fixed. So that, that's, a, that, uh, that's a way to write the equation. Uh, so I consider uh, the, in a semi geotropic equation, I can consider uh, one particular case of the equation where I work everything on a torus on a fixed domain. So, the, so, so that's why what I'm, I'm in here. So yet of course, the general problem is very complicated, yes. Okay. All right. So now let's look at this equation and what kind of smoothing can we expect with certain initial, you know, with certain boundary data. And so, as I mentioned, if we look at the expression for the Q Laplace term, this term can be double sum when Q is less than two or when Q bigger than two, but the gradient of U is less. But somehow, let's say that we, we know some information about U, let's say U is C2, then somehow this term on the right-hand side is not so bad when Q is at least two. And so therefore, when Q is at least two, we can hope that the solution can be C4. That's what I hope, but maybe we don't know whether we can get it, but that's the hope. On the other hand, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, you can have the minimum in the interior and the gradient of you vanish in the interior. And so therefore we have trouble with this term when Q is less than two. And so then when Q is less than two, it's impossible to have the continuity of the right-hand side. And so therefore it's impossible to have a C4 solution for this equation. And so therefore when Q is less than two, the best hope I can have for this equation is that U is C3 beta. And so that's what uh, we expect. And so it turns out that in two dimension, we can confirm all these expectations. And so this is the result of the John work with uh, Binzo. Uh, so we look at this uh, singular fourth order equation of Mons of type and the expression on the left hand side is the upper type equation. And so let me recall that capital UIJ is your matrix of cofactors of the Hessian of U. And we look at this second boundary value problem describing the value of the unknown Hessian U and describing the determinant of the Hessian of U on the boundary. And so because the determinant of the Hessian of U is related to W, so I just describe the value of W on the boundary. And so now I impose some condition for F0. And so usually, uh, the condition I wrote out here, I said that F0 is almost increasing in Z, but the example we have in mind is that any odd degree polynomial in Z we satisfy. And so that's the, the, the example. And so therefore, uh, so with this kind of F0, F0 is not the anti-derivative the derivative of any convex function because uh, the convex function you have increasing, but it's almost increasing. And so we just care about the highest order. If it's, actually a polynomial. And so for, we work in two dimension. And so if Q, so Q is in the Q Laplace term here, Q is at least two, then we have the uniformly convex solution U belong to C4 beta for suitable beta with the appropriate estimate for some beta and some C depending on the data. And the data means the parameter Q, the domain omega, the function F naught, and the boundary data phi and psi. And psi is seen to be strictly positive on the boundary. On the other hand, when Q is less than two, but bigger than one, then this equation had the uniformly convex solution U belong to C3 beta uh, with suitable atomers. And all the atomers and all the parameter depends on the data. And so somehow, if we look at this equation, we see that on the left-hand side here, you need somehow two derivative of, of W to compute uh, the Hessian matrix of W. But somehow in this case, the way we understood the standard solution is that we just write out is it just the I of U capital IJ and the J of W. And so this is the expression we understand when U is just three, three meter. All right. And so this is what we uh, obtain in two dimension. And so somehow we say that if 
F0 is actually increasing, then actually the solution is unique because if we look at the way that we write out the uh, functional, the energy here, when F0 here is increasing, the function uh, capital F0 can be taken to be convex. And so this, we have a convex functional. And so somehow we had a unique of the solution. But the point of our analysis is that F0 here is almost increasing. So capital F0 is not convex. And so therefore, we don't have the convex functional actually. It's almost convex. All right. And so that's the uh, solvability result. And so now I would mention some uh, uh, previous results. And so, so now I turn on the parameter gamma. And so when gamma is equal to zero and the function F0 just depends on the spatial variable. And so this problem is well studied by many authors, including the previous work of Turing going Wang, Zhao and Weichels, and by myself. And in this case, uh, we would like to understand the Calderon Zitmun estimates for this equation. So let's say that F0 belongs to LP. We want to obtain the solution U belong to W4P. And so this is the, the idea. And so it turns out that the smallest value P, we can do the Calderon Zitmun theory if P is exactly N. And so this works for all dimension, but we need P at least N. And so the number N just comes from the fact that if we would like to apply the APP estimate, the Alex Sandro, Bakerman Bucci maximum principle, we need the right hand side to be in our end if we don't know anything about the ellipticity of the, uh, the equation. And so somehow this problem is very interesting in the sense that if we want to do the Calderon Zitmun estimate for the fourth order equation of this type, we need P to be at least N. And so this is different from the use of Calderon Zitmun where you can do for all of finite P from one to infinity. On the other hand, when gamma is equal to one, and so the only previous work were the case like when F0 equals zero, because somehow in this case, there's some way to estimate the solution. But if F0 in a zero, it will impossible until the work with Binzo. On the other hand, what happened in high dimension? So this is related to the question that Hung just asked uh, a couple of minutes ago. And so what happened in high dimension and so in this case, let's say that F0 equals zero and n at least three. And so somehow for all Q, and so it's work also for Q equal two for, but for all Q bigger than one and infinity, it turns out that we can solve this problem globally for gamma is small, bigger than zero, but small. And the question, the, the, the key open question is whether we can remove the small need of gamma, we don't know. Yeah, so yes, we can do some solvability, but it's, it, it comes from some, we need some smallness of the, the parameter gamma here. All right, so I mentioned that- Hey, that Nam. I, yes. yes. I've got a, a quick question. So you say you can do this for P uh, bigger than or equal to N. So is, is my question is, is this equal to also okay? Uh, that's a very good question. Certain estimates, uh, I think, to be precise, must be bigger than A. Th thank you for the question. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That's a very good question. So, uh, yes. Thank you. Sure. All right. And so I mentioned that uh, we consider this kind of fourth order monster bear type equation because it comes from some approximation of some model in economics. And so I will talk very impressionistically about some model in the monopolis problems that called the rossi sunni model. And so in this model, we have a monopolis would like to design some product lines, some set of products and with some price for its product in order to gain some maximum profits. And so of course, when we have some product, we have some price, we would like the customer to buy them because otherwise we don't have any profits. And so the customer will try to compute some utility function without buying anything the customer already has certain set of, util uh, of, uh, of uh, utilities value already. And so the customer will decide to buy the product if the utility function is above certain threshold and that threshold I call fee here. All right. And so it turns out that in economics, the utility function is the Lausanne trend form of the, the price. Of course, you can calculate the profits in terms of the product and the price. But the way that Rosen-Sony models that 
were designed by Roses and Sonnet about 20 years ago, is to look at the profit not in not in terms of a function of the uh, the price, but as a function of the utility function because of this relation between the price and the utility function. And so therefore, the for the Q power cost, then Roses and Sonnet model consider this type of functional, and so we have some expression, but we have some expression involving the, uh, the Q powers of the gradient view, and this is related to the quarter cost. And we have some expression here, and if you know the Lejeune grand form, and this is exactly related to the, uh, the, function, the function P, because the function P, the, that's the price, is also the uh, Lejeune grand form of the utility function. And so therefore, this quantity is called the selling price. And somehow, so we look at this profit functional in terms of the utility. And of course, Omega North is a set of all type of customers. So customer with certain preferences. And so we would like to maximize this profits because this is what the, uh, the monopolist would like to do. And so of course, we would like to maximize the profits under this constraint because the, uh, the customer would like to buy the product as long as the utility is above certain threshold. And so we look at this problem. And so this is what Rosé and Sony designed about uh, 20 years ago. And so this is a kind of very similar problem. You see that the integrands or the functional is not so difficult because somehow, let's say in, when Q is equal to, it's like the digital energy. But what's the uh, strange and difficult about this problem is that we have the a variational problem with a very strange convexity constraint on the set of all candidate U is the above certain function phi and phi is assumed to be convex. And by the way, because U is the Lejeune transform of the, the price. And so U is already a convex function already. And so this problem turns out to be very difficult. And another way to formulate the problem is to use the optimal transport. And so there's a machine to rewrite this problem into the optimal transport problem and that was done by Figali, Kim and McCann about 10 years ago. All right, so I would like to consider a simpler case of this equation. And so somehow, so this is the picture that I have in mind. So let me try to draw the picture. So let's say this is the domain omega. I would like to consider the function, this is my function phi and so phi is seem to be uh, globally convex. And so I would like to consider a very special case when u is exactly phi on the boundary of the domain omega naught. And so this is what I have in mind. And so u and phi coincide on the domain of the boundary omega naught. So in the constraint here, u can be larger than phi on the boundary of the domain omega naught. But in this case, let's consider that it's equal. And so somehow, if I do the extension, I put u exactly phi outside the domain omega naught and I have a globally convex function. And so therefore, in this case, somehow, uh, I would like to consider this as a special case of the Rosicini model, where I put that yields equal exactly phi on the boundary of the domain omega naught. And so that leads us to a new problem. And so instead of using the maximalities, I will use the minimalities. So I will change all the sign. And so this is the equation that I will consider. And so before we saw that, this term come with a negative sign. Now it come with a plus sign. And so this term in the Rosicini model, it's just the yield function. But now I consider more general function F naught. And so somehow I would like to minimize this functional subject to the constraint that you belong to S of phi. And what's the S of phi? S of phi is initially it's a set of all function U convex defined on the domain omega naught, but somehow it had the convex extension outside omega naught and outside omega naught is equal to the function phi. And so somehow the minimum value here and the minimum value of this problem is related to somehow the minimum value of this problem is not smaller than the minimum of this, uh, of this problem. And so if we consider this problem, then this problem had a minimizer and actually uh, the not hard to see that because if we look at this problem, then we look at the constraint set and any member of the constraint set 
it leaves it and the leaves it bound is bounded by the leaf norm of the function phi. And so therefore we have, if you have a sequence of member in S of phi, we have the locally uniform convergent in, in the compact subset of omega. And so omega is the, the set that cover omega naught. All right. However, if we look at this kind of problem, this problem is already difficult, but somehow there's another problem in elasticity that it had some similar flavor of this problem. The only problem is that we don't have the Q, uh, the, the gradient Q term, and that's come from elasticity. So I would like to mention a paper of Inter Basco in Arma this year, where he looked at the, um, he wanted to describe some thin elastic cell and then when he described the leading order behavior of the elastic cell, he had to minimize certain functional. And this functional, the unknown is the function u. And here you have the function q, but q here is a given function. So therefore, let's uh, try to ignore this term already. And somehow we try to minimize this problem. And this problem we have to minimize over a convex function u globally in R2, but it's equal to this quadratic function outside the domain um, omega naught. And so this comes from elasticity. And so it had the same flavor as in the Rosetta model. In any way, we saw a frictional problem with a very strange convexity constraint. And so that problem is very hard to compute numerically. And so therefore, the question is that whether we can design some robust approximation to approximate the minimizer of our problem. And so, so far there has some proposals. I think the, the earliest proposal come from the paper by Kali and Radis, where he worked with the case, where they worked with the case when the Lagrangian are independent of the gradient variable. And after that, I did some work where we can cover the case when the Lagrangian depends on the gradient variable like in the uh, du of to the power q. And so what's interesting about the approximation is that we give the second boundary value problem of the Apple equation. And so let me explain a little bit more about this approximation. And so this is the variational problem that we would like to understand its minimizer. And so the candidates is a set of all convex function U and it's equal to phi outside omega naught. And so somehow how can we do the approximation. So I will take care of two things at the same time. I will take care of the convexity by adding the term, so log of the determinant. The way we see is that, because if we want to compute this term, we need the determinant of the Hessian of yield to be positive. And so it's very natural to consider yield to be convex. And so this small epsilon is to regularize. On the other hand, I want to take care of the fact that yield is equal phi outside the domain omega naught, so I add this term. And so somehow I have a new functional m epsilon. If we consider this functional and suppose that we compute the value, if this value is uniformly bounded, then somehow this term is uniform bounded, so that force you to be very close to phi outside the domain omega naught. And of course, I have to modify the the, the gradient term a little bit because somehow if we try to write out the euler larang equation, and as you saw, if Q is smaller than two, then if you write out the euler larang equation, you have a lot of trouble with the Q Laplacian term. And so therefore I approximate the, the gradient term, I regularize and I also try to approximate the value of phi outside the domain omega. And so the point is that I just look at this as an approximation of the functional, but I do not work directly with the functional. What would I do? I just look at the euler laran equation formally. Just write out the euler laran equation as you wish. You take the uh, compactly support function, you calculate the variation, and you write out the euler laran equation. And you want to solve on the bigger domain omega. And so you have to impose some boundary condition and the way we impose the boundary condition is to yield the second boundary value. And so we impose the boundary value of U and the determinant of the Hessian. And so let me write out the equation. And so if we just formally write out the Euler-Laurent equation, so this is what we obtain. We obtain on the 
left hand side is some expression like the upper equation because that's come from the log of the determinant. On the other hand, the expression for F0 come from taking the variation of this term together with this term. And so therefore, this is very complicated, but the point is that this function F0 here now can have a jump over the, the interior domain omega naught. And so what would I do? I boost some boundary data and the boundary data for you, I boot exactly the function phi because phi just are constrained. But what is interesting is that I have a lot of freedom to boot the boundary data for the function W. And so I can boot any sign and that's with the positive uh, value on the boundary, that's all I need. And so what's interesting about this system is that we can solve it in two dimension, like in the solvability that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago. And because as you saw, there's a possible uh, discontinuity across the boundary omega naught. And so therefore F naught here is never continuous. And so therefore we don't expect to have the solution to be C C4. And so the best we can hope is that FW is kind of you know, bounded and you have the solution W4S for all S finite. And so that's the best we can hope. And now, we want to see what's it, what, what is it good about this solving this system. It turns out that if we let epsilon go to zero, then u epsilon, the solution to this system, will converge uniformly on compact subset of the domain omega to the unit minimizer of our original problem here. And so somehow it said that we look at this kind of equation related to the Sony. Uh, process your model in economics and we turn it into some problem related to complex geometry like the upper equation, but we solve the second boundary value problem. And at the end of the day, the solution to this second boundary value problem convert to the unit minimizer of our process on your model. And so this is uh, the result. All right, are there any questions? All right, so uh, I don't think I have a lot of time to talk about the proof of the uh, approximation results. So I will have uh, a few minutes to talk about how to solve the original system here. So without any approximation, how can we do that? And so uh, proof yields the uh, prior right atomers and fourth order derivative atomers. And so somehow at a certain point, we would like to apply the maximum principle and we would like to apply the maximum principle to the equation satisfied by W. And so therefore, in the classical maximum principle, it will be derivative for W to apply it. And so somehow, as you saw already, when Q11 and two, we don't have the C4 solution. And so that we have a lot of trouble. And so the way we do is, is that we approximate the Q Laplacian term. And so we add a small parameter epsilon so that if we solve this system, if we, we can successfully solve the system, then we have the C4 solution and then we can apply the maximum principle. And so that's, your, that's the first step. And so we have to solve an approximating system. And so it turns out that if we add a small parameter epsilon into the Q Laplace term here, we can solve this problem and we have a uniformly convex U epsilon belong to C4 gamma globally for any gamma less than one. The trouble is that the C4 gamma norm is blowing up. However, when Q is at least two, we can have a uniform C4 beta for suitable beta independent of epsilon. And so therefore we can pass to the limit. And so that's one point. And on the other hand, when Q is less than two, we can have the uniform C3 beta and the beta and the C here are independent epsilon. So we, that's, we can pass to the limit. And so therefore, now we just focus on this approximating system and talk about C4 solution because that's what we, we, we do. So how to, how to solve this system? And so we yield a prioritized C4 gamma atomus and degree theory. And so the key atomus, maybe if I have time, uh, maybe I will talk about how to do the determinant atomus because this is the crucial atomus. And after we can get the lower bound and the upper bound on the determinant of U, then we look at this equation. The left hand side is just the linear right Monson operator. And the right hand side, now if we look at the expression, 
when we have the upper bound on the determinant of the hessian of q, we can bound the gradient of u. And so therefore, the right-hand side had a virgin form of some bounded vector field. And so therefore, we can use some technique from the linear among some equation to obtain the global uh, C alpha estimate for W. When we get the whole the regularity of W, now we have the Monsoba equation for U with the right hand side E globally hold the continuous. And so therefore we can use the global C2 alpha estimate for Monsoba equation. So they are due to 2021 and also Savint to estimate the C2 alpha for U. And so when we have the C2 alpha for U, then we look at the matrix cofactor capital UIJs. So this is just the cofactor matrix of the Hessian. And so therefore it's now uniformly elliptic. And so now we can use the sub the theory for uniformly elliptic equation. And so now let me focus on the determinant estimates. And so the first step is a very general estimate. We estimate the uniform bound for the solution itself. And so this is the estimates equal for all dimension. And it's come from a very general argument using the euler lorentz equation of an OMO convex functional and some gal curvature computation. Okay. And so now let's go to the determinant estimates. So if we don't have the term F naught, then somehow if we look at the expression on the right hand side, that the expression on the right hand side is non positive because this is a very simple calculation. And so therefore, if we look at the function W, then we see that W attain the minimum on the boundary. But on the boundary, W is no. And so therefore, it had this lower bound. But W is just the inverse of the determinant of the Hessian of U. And so therefore, we have the upper bound of, of U, uh, upper bound for the determinant of the Hessian of U. And from this, we can use some other argument to go further. But in our problem, we have the term F0. And so we don't know how to do it. It turns out that in two dimension, we can use the postulates and transform to give up about for the determinant of the Hessian of U. And so let me explain a little bit about this postulates and transform. All right, uh, so somehow we know that for the Lausanne and transform it is very useful in a monsoon type equation, not only for the use of second order monsoon equation, but also in a fourth order monsoon type equation, but we haven't seen any kind of use of the partial Lausanne transform for fourth order monsoon type equation. We saw a lot of application of the partial Lausanne transform for the monsoon equation, but not for the fourth order monsoon equation. So I will try to explain from the beginning. So let's say in two dimension, we use the partial Lausanne transform for function U with two variables x1 and x2. We carry out the partial Lausanne transform in the x1 variable. And so we don't do anything for the x2 variable. So the new variable will be C and eta. And so C is called the U sub X1 and eta is just X2. And we create the new function, the new function U star. So this is the expression of U star in terms of the original function U. So with this, we call this is the partial Lysenko transform and we can compute all sort of order or sort of partial derivative of the new function in terms of the original function U. So I will skip all the calculation, but the point is that if we look at the monsoon equation, we have a dual equation. And so this is the dual equation. Somehow, if we just fix the value of the determinant of the Hessian of U, let's say some F, then actually we have a linear equation for the dual function U star. And a very nice way to look at this equation, even in the case when F equal one, and then this case we have just a harmonic function for U star. And from that we can carry, we can go a lot of, uh, we can do a lot of things to prove actually U in this case must be a quadratic function. And so that's called a Jurgen theorem. And so now let's see what happened if we carry out this analysis to the fourth order equation. And so we have a very complicated fourth order equation. And so this is our equation and W is the determinant of the inverse of the determinant of the Hessian of U. And so somehow it turns out that in the dual domain omega star, the partial Lausanne and transform U star satisfies some dual equation. This equation look very daunting. It's involving some expression for the dual W star of W, but the dual of W here is exactly the determinant of the Hessian of U. 
And so if we look at integration for the first time, it looks very daunting, but let's come back to this view of the moms of equation. If we use the past solution transform, somehow we have a linear equation for U star. And on the other hand, we have a somehow a semi-linear equation for W star. And so somehow if we just focus on the first two terms here, is it very similar to the deal of the moms of equation. And so there's a lot of uh, term in the F star here. I don't have the courage to write them down, but the point is that F star can be estimated from below by certain expansion involving the second derivative of U star. And so somehow this is not so bad because we are considering the equation for W and W is involved with two derivative of, uh, of you, and so somehow we can view at this uh, low order term. On the other hand, if we look at the equation, if we try to apply the maximum principle, if we try to ignore this expression here, then we look at what are the free term here. They just involve the first derivative of W star. And so if we just apply the maximum principle, the derivative will not have any trouble. And so therefore, that is exactly what will we do. Uh, so I would mention that our equation here come from the euler lorentz equation of some functional. And so in order to write out the DO equation, we look at that functional in the DO variable and we do the variation in the DO variable. So that's how we get the DO equation. And so let me tell you the key estimate. And the key estimate is how to obtain the derivative, the determinant of Hessian of U from above. And so that's the key estimate. And so somehow, as we saw, if we look at the, the expression for W, it's almost a sub-solution. It's said that we have some maybe a little bit uneasy term involving the first derivative of W star. It turns out that if we add some expression involving U, so some constant multiplied by U, and that quantity is called Z, and it turns out that a short calculation that if Z alpha is large, then Z is actually a sub-solution. But Z is a sub-solution, meaning that Z attain its maximum on the boundary of the DO domain. But on the boundary of the DO domain, you know everything about you because we are solving the second boundary value problem. And on the other hand, on the boundary of the DO domain, you know the determinant of the Hessian of U because we are solving the second boundary value of U. And so therefore everything we know on the boundary of the dual domain. And so therefore we can estimate from above the, because Z attain the maximum on the boundary. So therefore we can uh, estimate W star from above. But W star is nothing but the determinant of the Hessian of U. On, so therefore we obtain this key estimate. And from after that, we can go further with certain techniques. So uh, to obtain the other side, uh, how many minutes do we have? I, I think it's time to wrap it up. Okay. And so this is the key estimate. So you see that this is the case that we handle the K with the F not non zero. And so after that, we use the Lausanne transform form to obtain the other side. And it turns out that for the Lausanne transform, form, we don't need to derive it uh, two dimension. We, need, uh, we can work in any dimension. And so the new point of this analysis is that we use the postulates and transform to obtain the key estimates for the determinant of the hazard of yield from above. And that's work only in two dimension, but in high, and after that, we can use the Lausanne transform to obtain the other bow, the lower bow for the determinant of the hazard of yield from below. And that's estimate work for all dimension. And after we obtain that, we can use some techniques from the linear Monson equation to, uh, to obtain the uh, holder estimates for the function W. And after that, we can use the technique uh, of this uh, regularity of the Monson equation from the result of tuning going one and solving to obtain the C2 alpha estimates for, for you. And I think uh, that's how the, the proof goes. And so somehow the key point here is that to use the postulates and transform to the fourth order equation. And after that, we use the Lausanne and transform. And after that, everything will go through. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. So uh, are there questions or comments or 
you know, uh, discussions with Nam that you would like to do? Please go ahead. Sure, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, please. So in all these functionals you're considering, there's always the uh, Q Laplace energy appearing. I was wondering how sensitive your results are if you just replace Q Laplace by some convex function of the gradient of U. Oh, that's a, a great question. So uh, somehow let me mention what works and what doesn't work. Let's see, okay. So somehow, the Laplacian will not create any trouble if we write down the DO equation using the postulates and transform. That will not create any trouble because everything comes from some functional and we spread everything into the DO variable and do the version over there. And so that's work. However, somehow there's a term N here. I did not write out, it's so complicated that strongly depends on the expansion of the Q Laplacian term. And so this expression for n here it takes two lines to write down, even for the kilo Russian term, and this is very sensitive. And actually, we don't know how to estimate that term because we need that term to have a favorable sign and a little negative like in this case. And so it is sensitive in that sense. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Sure. Are there other questions or concerns for now? Yeah, maybe I have just two quick questions. I mean, the first one is already on this slide. I mean, basically uh, the, the partial Lejeune transform is quite amazing to me. I've never used it. And uh, in, you know, in this case, you know, uh, the equation for W star is also uniformly elliptic because you already have the a priori estimates on W star, right? That's sort of one of the... And, uh, in this case, no, we just know that it is strictly positive. We don't have any that information about W star because W star is the determinant of a hazard of Q. We don't know anything. Oh, so, so you, you essentially... Have applied, uh, so, so you see that at the, when F naught is non-zero, a priori, we have no information about it at all. And so the key estimate we use the postulates and transform to obtain it bound from above. Mm -hmm. Because it's a sort of a sub-solution. So W star, like right, right in this way, is a sub-solution. And so it, uh, it has the maximum on the boundary. And on the boundary, we know the information about W star. We, so I, I can tell, tell you this. We only know it on the boundary, but we don't know anything in the interior. Okay. Yeah, but it doesn't matter because you just apply the maximum principle. So in principle, it can be degenerate elliptic or something like that, right? But in this case, it, because we consider the uniformly uh, elliptic equation, so W star is strictly positive, but we don't know what it is. But, uh, so it's always positive, but we don't know how big or how small it is. And thanks. And the other question is that you said, you know, like on the boundary, uh, you have phi and C and C you know, there has no relation with phi. Um, is it, right. you know, essentially, of course, you know, in the tangential di directions, you already have all informations, but because of the sort of normal directions allows you certain flexibilities that you, you know. Uh, oh, in this case, we consider the W here, it just the determinant has an view, it involves the second derivative. So the, even if you know some information about the third derivative, it does not give you any further relation between phi and psi because uh, psi is related to the second derivative. It's not related to the third derivative. Yeah, so yeah. What, 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 what I mean is that essentially it because you have a lot of flexibility going in the normal directions, right? That's sort of... Right. That's right. right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, are there other questions or concerns for them? All right, so if not, then let's thank Nams again, and uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And uh, I think that uh, it's, it's good to end our seminar today. Uh, and then we have, I, I think, like one more talk to go next week, uh, you know, by Luz Caffarelli. And I think that's pretty much it for my.